What Happens in the Woods is a true crime podcast. We discuss events that are often violent in nature. Listener's discretion is advised. You're in an area where murder is uncommon. To have three occur in such a short time span was more than unsettling. One is bad, two could be coincidence, but three, three goes beyond the hail of coincidence. There is no way that these three murders were committed by different people. They were all committed by the same person. Detectives are now on the hunt for a single suspect, a serial killer. Someone with the means and motivation to attack three very different women. This leaves investigators looking for a suspect with both a history of breaking and entering and a connection to the east side scene. When they reach out to their counterparts in the Seattle Police Department, they get a new name, George Waterfield Russell. people in this world that know how to manipulate and spin a situation in order to get exactly what they want of you. Stories are countless from across the nation of grifters, opportunistic thieves, as well as con men and women who are willing to go to any means necessary to come out ahead. It's almost as if they have a sixth sense in order to find the most willing and naive participants for their cons. If you're lucky, you'll never meet a person such as this. If you're not, well, the best you can hope for is that you're left unharmed and a little bit wiser. This episode, we take a look at a deep and involved case from the greater Seattle area. The murder of three women in their prime who could barely be connected by a single thread. The only thing seemingly in common? Their nightlife activity in the city of Bellevue, Washington, and their connection to a man with a rap sheet that would astound anyone in the true crime arena. This is True Crime Podcast, What Happens in the Woods, with your host, Justin Bryce. Let's get started. Happy Friday, friends. We hope that everyone is well, uh, staying safe and doing their part to slow the spread of this disgusting disease. Stay at home, wear your mask. No comment. No. <laughs> okay, fine. Leave me out here. It's fine. Um, This one's going to be a long one, so I'm going to not have chit chat. Do you have any updates? Australia's still leading. UK yeah. is coming in behind very fast. Yeah, I think the UK is like solely my friend. <laughs> I don't know if she's solely responsible, but I have a friend that I worked with when we lived in California that moved over there and she recently messaged me and was like, "I you're getting me through quarantine right now." Mm. So, thank you. Awesome. Yeah. All right, any anything else? I need every fucking bit of second to go through this. All right. This is going to be some shit. Uh, So we hope that you're ready for this one. Grab some snacks and a good drink. You're going to need it. Get settled in and comfortable. And I know that we give a disclaimer, but this episode we have for you may get a little disturbing when we get to the crimes and the victims. So I always have this great like internal debate of do I add graphic detail? Do I not? If I add it, do I add it all? It's it's different for everybody, the level of comfort that they have on knowing the details. You know what you can handle. I'm just giving fair warning. You, you may not be able to listen to all of this. With that being said, we are going back to the early 90s in Bellevue, Washington for this one. If you've listened to us, you know that we've covered a couple of crimes that took place there in our last season. And I didn't realize how much damn crime was going on there in the 90s. wonder what it's about. Well, this this one's a little different than what we've covered 
from there, not necessarily what we've covered in general, but I, yeah, it's, it's a little different. I also didn't realize that Bellevue was like the hot spot for going out and partying and clubbing, like bar scene type things. Evidently. I, I had no idea. Just goes to show that I'm old and I don't do that anymore. So <laughs> never really did it in the first place, but yeah. it, it is apparently was at least in the 90s. I can't say whether it is now today or not, but I can't either. Yeah, I don't know. We're not about that life. So this episode is on convicted criminal George Russell Jr. and the three women that he brutally murdered. Some information I got in my research was from Murderpedia, but also older newspapers that are online by searching Google. And I swear to God, when I can, I there's a couple of libraries that I want to hit up and it makes me sound so just funny, daddy. But I really want to go scan like the archives and look at these old newspaper clippings because a lot of them are not online and I would have liked to have been able to reference them, but I, I read about them, but couldn't find them. So it's kind of, that's not the first time that's happened. So I also read a book on his life called Charmer, a ladies man and his victims by Jack Olson. I read in some discussion threads that there's also mention of George Russell in John Douglas's book, Mindhunter, which I haven't read yet. It's on my to-do list. I haven't read it yet. I'm about halfway through his book titled Journey into Darkness. We both really love the show, and I hope that it gets continued for at least one more season. Yeah. It's, uh, it'd be sad if it, if it wasn't. It was, it was just so good. But there's definitely, you know, if you like that show, there's definitely things that you can find. John Douglas has written several books uh, alone and with other people. So there are many layers to George Waterfield Russell Jr. He was always described as jovial, large personality. He was larger than life. He fucking knew everyone. He knew where the action was. He knew where to be. And it seemed like he was just everywhere all at once. And he was able to fit in with a younger crowd a little more easily than somebody his own age. But he was comfortable talking to everybody. He would strike up a conversation. Most people he knew said that they felt like he took just this intense personal interest when they were talking and that he was a real listener. I think part of the reason that people kept enabling him in his crimes was because of his ability to charm. That's just how he was. Yeah. Some people are like that. Some people are. And I mean, it's kind of a gift in his place. Like in his case, it should have been a warning sign and and it wasn't. Yeah. Well, I call those people sociopaths, those people that are very intense. Yeah, he definitely is a sociopath. So the truth is George Russell was immature. He was juvenile, even into his 30s. He was a master of manipulation and I would consider him like a classic narcissist sociopath. Very self-involved. He was good at presenting himself to the world um, in one way to like gain trust and get information. But he, you know, was able to fool the public at large. His ego was off the fucking charts. And you'll kind of get a sense of that as we get into some of his crimes. He was very secretive. People just didn't know anything about him. And he wouldn't talk about shit. What he did tell you you didn't know was a lie, but it, all, all of it was a lie. Okay. He, he would reveal exactly what he wanted you to know. And that was it. That's all you were going to get from him. You couldn't have asked more than one or two questions before he cut you off. And that was that. And wow. you, you just weren't going to get anything. So there are a lot of details about George's younger years. A lot of things that are red flags to people who study like criminology or psychology in relation to true crime. I had to really pare down details. There is a wealth of knowledge, especially if you read that book that I mentioned. It, there's so many details and so many people involved because he just fucking knew everybody and inserted himself into so many different people's lives. And there's like, there's no end to the amount of petty crime and unbelievable things that this guy was able to get away with. When he was just a preteen and a young adult, I had to like really summarize. Otherwise, this could have easily been like a three or four part episode. Which you would love. I would. And it. I mean, 
I think I think we could have done a full 10 episodes on this guy, to be honest with you. There are podcasts that, you know, just do like a season of, yeah. of one, one case. Person. This easily could have been one of those if we were set up that way. So it was it was really hard for me to to not include information because it just all of it is relevant. All of it. I couldn't find a one damn thing that wasn't like, oh, wow. OK, that's that's kind of weird or that's creepy or that makes sense. And now you understand why X, Y and Z. It's it's all just so much. So when um, when we look at the crimes that take place in Bellevue, it's easy to see how George got away with it for a little while. His prior criminal history was already extensive by the age of 18. Looking back, it's easy to go through and, you know, pull together your basic serial killer biography from all the information. Yeah. First thing I felt was important to note was, of course, his family life, you know, fundamental and building blocks of a person's life. Yes. Neither of his parents wanted him. Uh, he was initially raised by his grandmother. When his mom married a dentist who worked in Seattle, he moved from Florida to live with them. That was about the age of six. The family was one of very few African-American families on Mercer Island, and they kept to themselves for the most part. There's just there's no sort of physical abuse that he was subjected to in any references that I looked. There's also no sexual abuse that I could find that was referenced. There was, however, indifference um, from his mom, from his stepdad, from his grandma. The entire family had nothing but indifference for George when he was... I think it was about 14. His younger sister was born. Um, there was no question that she was the favorite. So when he was 16, his mom left and moved to Maryland with his younger sister. His stepdad was having an affair with a white woman that he knew through business. Mm. And the mom just wasn't going to watch it go down. She wasn't going to hang out. Mercer Island's a very small community. Yeah. And a lot of the, you know, they were educated. He was a dentist. She was a professor uh -huh. and they moved in certain circles and she didn't, she just didn't want to hang out with it and, and watch it go down. So George's sister automatically went with his mom. But when it came to George, they actually like fought like, no, you keep him. No, he's yours. And he ended up staying with the stepdad. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, it definitely, you know, has a lasting effect yeah. on him. So the next thing that I was looking at was criminal history. He actually started pretty early around the age of 12, but probably sooner. And that's just what, you know, began being documented, even for as much as is documented. And he was actually charged with. There's so much more that they couldn't charge him with. Yeah. It was stupid stuff at first. It, it wasn't about the crime. It was about him getting away with the crime and about him proving that he was smart enough to do it. He would lie, you know, to your face, making up whatever story came to mind. And he would say it with a smile, like so genuine that police officers in the, you know, on the island would, they'd be like, oh, yeah, that's just George. Oh, yeah. Um, OK. And they all knew that he was doing these these things like everybody in the community knew. And for whatever reason, they felt sorry for him. They they didn't you know want to be another like be the cause of another problem that he had. Yeah. They just kind of let it let it slide. So repeatedly, he was able to sweet talk his way out of theft, breaking and entering, selling younger kids drugs and alcohol, even being caught hanging outside people's homes and bushes at nights. There are stories after stories of him stealing from friends from their homes, ratting out people who he uh, was with when they got caught in criminal activity. And even though the community, like I said, he they all knew that he was a fucking liar. Yeah. He put on that smile and he would talk his way out of anything. He was even able to get in good with the police and become an informant using that as a bargaining chip in his own criminal sentencing. So while he's still doing criminal activity yeah. and getting charged with these things, he's also informing for the police. Hmm. And it, I mean, it just happened. It just, it was fine. <laughs> it was just fine. He really was like a master manipulator. So the next thing to look at is intelligence. We know most sociopaths are highly intelligent. Yeah. Well, George was no different. He it stated in the book that he had an IQ of 180, which is incredible. Yeah. Um, he was able to sweet talk his way out of homework, out of schoolwork, because the teachers knew he was smart enough to do it. But he he didn't do it. Um, so even with a high Q that high, he dropped out of high school in his junior year. So he never graduated. 
The last couple of things that are usually mentioned with serial killers and sociopaths is did they hurt or torture animals and what was their sexual life like, early sexual experiences? Nowhere did I read in any of any research from anywhere that he showed any signs of animal torture or anything like that. Um, Something I did find interesting was that he only was attracted and hit on white females. He didn't like feel comfortable around people of color. Yeah. And it's very often noted that he didn't quote act black, whatever that means. But Mm. I, you know, preconceived notions being what they are, especially in the nineties. Yeah. He would use self depredation to make people feel at ease with the color of his skin, but he himself like didn't feel at ease with it. And he would, you know, he would act a certain way. Then when he would get in prison, he was called Oreo because they, all these people kept saying, you're a black man trying to act white. And, you know, he would put on this kind of persona of what he thought a black man should sound like, Mm -hmm. but it was like forced. It was, it wasn't not, he just wasn't, wasn't himself natural, yeah. period, whether he wanted to sound white, black or however he wanted to sound, he just wasn't at ease with himself. Yeah. And there were many times when he would say that he didn't find black women attractive, didn't want to have anything to do with them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, was very adamant about how he felt towards black people in general. Yeah. It was, it was interesting. It also mentioned that after his mom moved out, he made a sexual advance to his new stepmom. And when confronted, you know, she right away went to the stepdad and she was like, what the fuck? Yeah. And he confronted George and uh, he flipped the story and he said, no, 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 she hit on me. Like, I, I'm just as surprised as you are. Why would she do that? The stepdad wasn't buying it. I mean, by that time, he, <laughs> he was almost a hardened criminal. Yeah. He kicked him out. He was like, you got to get the fuck out. So from there, George was just kind of a drifter. He he slept at people's houses. He kind of went back and forth. He he didn't really have a c- consistent home yeah. after that. You would see him constantly with these like a duffel bag that he kept a lock on and paper bags that contained like assorted bo- books and magazines, um, a lot of porn, just weird stuff. He liked to read about uh, Ted Bundy, our friend. And the Green River Killer, as well as other like police procedurals, detective crimes. And then he also had a like a textbook on police procedure and crime scene investigation that he carried with him everywhere. Really? Yeah. If anyone like dared touch his shit, he went fucking nuts. He he was very private, very you know closed off. He didn't want anybody to touch any of his stuff, yeah. no matter if he left it at somebody's house. He would threaten, don't touch my shit. So it was, it was kind of interesting that he, at that time, had aspirations to become a police officer. Of course. And did. that's why he was all, you know, like, very interested in that. Um, one running theme in all the research that I did was that he hit on every girl that came into his site. It wasn't actually until his 20s, though, that he had some sort of a long term relationship. That was with a 14-year-old girl. Okay. Um, the relationship, for lack of a better term, lasted a few months, even during one of his longer stints in jail. She actually found out that she was pregnant during that time. Wow. He had used no protection. And uh, she ended up, unfortunately, getting an abortion. The relationship came to an end just before he was le- released from jail, and it just kind of filtered off. His next serious relationship wouldn't be until a couple of years later. And it was with a more appropriate, like age appropriate female yeah. by her account. So they, it was just there. So one day, you know, they're having a couple of nice dates and she had just barely met him and he was this really good listener. And then the next day he just shows up her to, at her apartment with his shit and a cat and, and, a cat. and never left. Yeah. And the cat, the cat named Sasha. Mm. Yeah. And, and he, you know, just hung out. He didn't leave. And he ended up actually being physically and mentally abusive to her. So she filed a restraining order on him. This is actually about four months before the murders take place. So that's his mental state at that time. So in the late 80s, the clubbing scene in Bellevue exploded. By day, it was a city of upscale restaurants, a booming tech industry, and this very well-known wealthy shopping center that, you know, all all the people went to shop at. By night, it was like club life at its finest. 
you could find anything, like any place to go. And they all had themes. They all had just these ridiculous, you know, come for ladies night, come uh, for moolah dollar night and like just all these weird. And then there was just weird themes of the clubs themselves. You know, I think of Las Vegas, some of the stuff that I was reading, it was just that outrageous. So basically if you could pay to play, there was fun to be had Yeah, and everybody knew everybody. They all were hanging out at the same places. They were all from local play, you know, the same area. They, you know, people went out in groups, they worked together. It was a pretty interwoven scene. I would say. So 27 year old Marianne Polreich loved to go out. She loved to have a good time. She was kind of new to doing this kind of stuff. She grew up in a very religious family and she was getting a taste of living on her own, having a good time. Uh, She and a group of friends were regulars at a club called Papagayo's Cantina on the weekends. They went to other places, but this was the main place where she felt comfortable and would go regularly several times during the week. You know, if you went on a Friday, Saturday, uh, sometime during the week, maybe for drinks after work, that wasn't unusual. Yeah. On the night of June 22nd, 1990, Marianne was out with two male friends. She quickly got wasted on something called electric iced tea, which is kind of a like a signature drink at the club that was a close relation to a Long Island iced tea. So if you've <laughs> ever had one of those, you know, you're fucked. Yeah. And she kind of, you know, after she started drinking, she flipped the switch from like this shy, responsible, you know, kind of just bland yeah. personality, you know, just your normal everyday citizen citizen yeah. to this party girl. And her friends kind of got irritated, left within an hour, even though she had driven. They were uh, kind of like, yeah, you're you're having a little bit too much fun. We're out. We're good. She was just, you know, mingling. She was going all over the place. She was being obnoxious. And they just kind of bounced. So she continued to drink. She wasn't affected. She was dancing. She was mingling. The DJ that night claimed that she asked him to play You Can't Touch This by MC Hammer (laughs) at least five fucking times. He played it twice to get her off of his case. She flirted heavily with a regular who had to tell her to back off. And those were basically the last accounts of her life. No one knows how she left or at what time or with who. So when we come back from a short break, we will get into the murders of the three victims. And I want to reiterate that the details in the victim's deaths are not for the faint of heart before we get back into this. The morning of June 23rd, 1990, around 725 a.m. outside the cage dumpster area in the back of Black Angus and McDonald's in Bellevue. The body of a young white female was found. The victim had no clothes, no identification. She had been very plainly and obviously posed for effect. Her head was turned to the side with a white canister lid over one eye. Her arms were clasped together, holding a pine cone at her abdomen, and her legs were crossed the left over the right. The only thing on her body was a gold necklace and a watch. They find red spots on the trash compactor in the dumpster area that are confirmed blood, but that kind of confuses the investigators as the body is obviously posed. So why would somebody want to crush it, but then decided to make it completely visible in a way that it would be found? Mm -hmm. When detectives start processing the scene, they know that there is no immediate discernible cause of death. She looks like she's been in just a bad car accident. The autopsy paints a very different picture. So her blood alcohol level was 0.14 at the time of death, which is like one and a half times the legal limit. Yeah. Under a black light, they find fibers and hairs that are later confirmed to be that of a black male. They also find semen on her upper thigh. There's no fingerprints. They even did like where they spray with a chemical and tint the body. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing. She has no fingerprints. So the victim had been punched in the face multiple times hit with an unknown object across the head, causing a skull fracture. On both breasts, there are bruises and scrapes, they think possibly from being dragged around the dumpster. She had taken such a force, like beating, from either being kicked or hit around her abdomen that her liver ruptured against her spinal column. Oh, Jesus. There were scratches along with bruising around her neck, suggesting that she tried to maybe fight back as she was strangled. And it's assumed that the necklace that she was wearing is what strangled her. So in a sick twist, after her death, she had been violently raped 
and they were there were small cuts with a you know where a foreign object had been inserted anally. They found traces of dirt and debris on her that told them that the dumpster was not the place that she had been killed. Okay. So police know they're dealing with a sick fuck. This is disturbing. They yeah. start questioning employees of Blank Black Angus. They are trying to get any idea of who their victim was. Nobody remembered seeing the victim at the restaurant the night before. She kind of looked vaguely familiar, but they just couldn't be sure. And keep in mind, her face had been hit. So some of her like facial features yeah. were out of place. Okay. Oh, I didn't know that it was that bad. It was that bad. Okay. Yeah. So they spend a few days trying to figure out who she is. It wasn't until the middle of the next week that they got a lead. So when Marianne Polreich didn't come home, her roommate began to worry. She called her parents and learned that they hadn't heard from her, neither had her job, and it was like completely out of character. She might go out and party, but she always came home, she always went to work, and every Sunday like clockwork, she was at her parents' house. So for her not to show up was absolutely unheard of. Okay. Didn't fit her. So the roommate learned from a friend that there was that body found behind Black Angus and she called police. Detectives show up and she confirms that the necklace and the watch were Marianne's. She had actually lent the necklace to her. It was actually her necklace. Oh, so it was her roommate. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So police now know that their victim, you know, is Marianne. They start to search the last known location where she was seen. That's Papagayo's Cantina. Yeah. They find her purse and a sweater that had been left and play, it was placed in lost and found because it was just discarded. Yeah. And they also found her car in the parking lot. Oh. So when they're talking to the roommate, they ask, you know, who could she think of somebody that might do this? Had she pissed anybody off? Was she dating? Did she bring guys home? Could this be about drugs? The roommate's like, no, no way. There's no way. Marianne didn't bring guys home. She didn't do drugs. She, you know, smoked, she drank, but she wasn't into partying that way. Yeah. There was a guy that de- um, she had, they had met at like a bar in North Seattle named Damon that she was talking to, but it wasn't a sexual relationship. Mm-hmm. But basically, she just wasn't like that. She'd go out and like flirt a little bit, but she wasn't promiscuous. She doesn't have any information on this guy other than his name is Damon. She doesn't know anything about him. Can't even give him phone number. Um, She can't tell him his last name. She gives them like a basic description yeah. and just like that, there's, there's no leads. It's kind of cold at that point. Right. So they start to canvas the neighborhood around Papagayo's um, detectives are hanging out for the next couple of weeks at the club, showing Marianne's picture all around asking if people recall seeing her there. There's a lot of regulars that are like, yeah, she looks familiar. She might've been there that night. I'm not sure how she left or who she left with or what time, you know, everybody's drinking, everybody's partying yeah. and nobody really thinks outside themselves in that case. Yeah. Oddly enough, the main security guy there at Papagayo's is a Bellevue uh, detective who works in public relations. Oh, so he has this second gig as a bouncer. Yeah. And he doesn't exactly remember seeing Marianne that night, but he does recall her being a regular and he, you know, kind of gives them some other information like, Oh, there was some, you know, couples were fighting in the parking lot. A guy came out and was looking for his buddy and noticed that his truck had been taken from the parking lot. He was very upset. There was some suspected maybe like pimping or drug deals going on that uh, the guy saw like a black car come pick Uh up a couple ladies, take off, you know, the usual shit that happens at a club on, on any given night. Yeah. As an afterthought, he tells the lead detective on the case, if you want to find out everything about Papagayos, talk to George Russell. Turns out George actually came to them. So while they're, you know, at the club asking people, do you recall this this girl? And do you recall that night? George comes up and he, you know, he had a few places that he went to regularly in the club circuit and everybody knew him. He was completely the charmer in his element. Mm -hmm. And he had frequented the Black Angus restaurant that had like a bar and a dance floor. George was well known there, but he wasn't always liked. So he would strike up conversations with anyone. But it was typical that he would either kind of sit to himself or he'd be out on the dance floor for hours. At Black Angus? At Black Angus, about a a lot of other places. But Black Angus, he, he seemed to prefer. Okay. 
there were times when he would show up with a Seattle PD hat, like wearing one and a police scanner. And he would sit at the end of the bar listening to this police scanner. And he was trying to spread this rumor that he was working with the police as an informant. And he was basically doing it to impress young girls. Yeah. When a cocktail wait- waitress there made it known that he was just a thief and a criminal because yeah. his reputation definitely uh, left Mercer Island and continued with him. Mm-hmm. Um, He threatened her, threatened violence, threatened to kill her uh, for her to, you know, don't talk about me. Don't don't say anything to me. You don't need to know about my personal business. Mm -hmm. Just leave me out of your mouth. Keep my name out your mouth. Right. And after that, he actually got banned from Black Angus. As one would. Um, Yeah. When you threaten people, you should expect that no matter how many good times you have there. So there were other places that he would flock to, but the newly opened Papagayo's Cantina, it had been uh, recently renovated and they had reopened and it was, it was quickly becoming his destination of choice that now that he couldn't go to Black Angus. So he quickly integrated himself as a club staple and some of the regulars there saw him so often and just how he like talked with people and, you know, knew everybody. They thought that he actually might work there or own it yeah was because say, was he the owner i he i mean he could have basically been so when he was there you know he would have like special reserved tables he would sit outside with the boun- bouncers chatting it up he would bring seem like people from the end of the line to the beginning of the line like girls that he thought should get in mm-hmm. and all these people were like oh you must work here like you must <laughs> you must, right yeah when he was there he paid for nothing he it was he walked in free. He didn't pay a cover charge. He didn't pay for drinks. He didn't pay for nothing. Wow, he's a hustler. He is definitely a hustler. So police, you know, start showing up at the Papagayo's Cantina, and they're asking about Marianne. And George comes over, introduces himself right away. Mm-hmm. There's three separate times and three separate officers that are there, and he he's pretty much first in line to talk to them every time. They show him a picture of Marianne. He says, uh, he doesn't know her. And then he's like, oh, yeah, you know, maybe I do. Maybe she does look familiar. And, you know, I I think if you want, you know, my buddy over here might have some answers for you. And he was guiding them in who to talk to. Yeah. And honestly, the way that it reads is he had more questions for them than he, they had for him. Oh. He was, you know, leading them to possible people of interest. He was giving them, you know, oh, names and yeah, you know, on this day, I seem to recall this and maybe this happened. And um, he starts, you know, pumping them for information on how much they have and what they've connected so far. Yeah, he was doing this investigation. Right. Or, well, George was. Yeah. He, you know, his leads that they give him, they don't amount to much. More often than not, the phone numbers that he would give for certain people to talk to were wrong yeah. or they weren't in service or the people didn't answer. So they kind of don't give him much more thought after that and think that he's a nuisance. He was not helpful and he might know a lot of people, but he didn't know much about this. Yeah. So investigators keep searching for this mysterious Damon. They have about three other good suspects um, as well to look at. And then another woman is found dead on August 9th. And just like Marianne, it's another very perverse crime scene that has investigators at a loss. The body of Carol Meath, uh, she's age 35, was found in her bed by her 13-year-old daughter oh, wow. on the morning of the 9th. And the entire fucking thing is, is sick. So both of her daughters were at home when she was murdered. The daughter that found her was up in the early morning hours and said someone shined a light in the hallway, in the bathroom, her nine-year-old sister's room, and her own room before going into their mom's room. She assumed that it was Carol's boyfriend at around 830 when Carol wasn't up. Her daughter thought it was odd, but let her sleep a little bit later. She tried the door to the bedroom and it was locked. So she went out back um, around to the sliding glass door that was off the master bedroom Mm -hmm. and she was able to get in that way. The door was open and when she went in, she saw a horrible crime scene. She immediately ran out, called her father, who lived not far from there, Carol's ex-husband, to come over. When he called 911, he told the operator he thought that Carol had committed suicide. Oh, shit. Aside from red high heels, Carol was naked. 
Her head was covered with plastic covering from like a dry cleaner that they would put over your clothes. Mm -hmm. It was wrapped uh, tightly around her head. And then there was a pillow just placed on top. She had been repeatedly bludgeoned on the left side of her head. Her body had been posed so that whoever opened the door would look directly at a long barrel shotgun inserted into her vagina. The shotgun was propped up with a blanket so that it was laying level with the body and not at an angle. There were blood smears on her legs, and then there was a, a piece of lingerie that was laid out on the bed as if the killer was going to dress her, yeah. then decided not to for whatever reason. But her underwear just were bunched like in the corner in contradiction. Maybe he was interrupted. Um, no, they, they presumed that he took his time and he had time okay. to, to lay out this crime scene. And it was very staged and very purposeful. Okay. So initially police look at Carol's boyfriend. They're told he's got this jealous streak and the couple had a tumultuous relationship at best. They were always egging each other on. Um, both were seeing other people at the same time. Carol worked as a bartender at a popular restaurant and bar in Bellevue called Casina Casina, where a lot of men hit on her. Um, she was a very popular bartender. Everyone police talk to say that she was sweet. She was straightforward type of woman, the kind of person who was always helping others. She had like a way of putting people at ease and even diffusing situations where like people who were drunk at her job, she could get them to think that they were ready to leave when they had just asked for another drink. Oh. And she was just so good at like reading the situation and diffusing that other bartenders in the area would come over and see how she did it yeah. so that they could get tips. Like she was one of the best. She was known to be sexually active, casually dating men. And there were a lot of people very upset by her death um, that she had been like in a relationship with or had seen previously. Yeah. After this scene has worked, they asked her ex and the girls to check if anything is missing. Right off the bat, it stated that she always wore two wedding band sets. One was gone. One was hers from the marriage with the ex. And then the other was her mother's. And she wouldn't have misplaced either one. Yeah. And she always wore them. There is also a possibility that some silver dollars that um, she was keeping that should have been in a dresser in a crown royal bag. She had multiple bags yeah. filled with like silver dollars. And I was thinking back to the time. This is about the time when people were collecting coins. Yeah. And, you know, that craze started where everybody was like inaugurative money and you would quarters. see it on TV yeah. in the quarters. And but silver dollars were like making this. I don't know. I don't know what the fascination was. I guess I didn't pay enough attention because I know my grandma had some. Yeah, I just think it was a resurgence in the. uh in the collectible game. Cause I know my maybe. dad was interested in them too. Yeah, maybe I, but anyways, she would keep change that she was given as tips. And then she had bags of like silver dollars and change that were in her dresser. They estimated about five or six bags were gone. Of just silver dollars. Of like silver, silver dollars and, and assorted, assorted coins. Oh, okay. Yeah. Which isn't much, you know, considering how much time and access this person had to her room, to her house, and felt comfortable walking around with a flashlight. Yeah. There's so much more that could have been taken. But we're done. We're done. Yeah. Especially with the girls there by themselves. Right. So when an autopsy is performed, they find multiple disturbing injuries. Um, she has two broken and protruding ribs, so they were bent backwards into her body. What the fuck? Yeah. The unknown object that had been used to hit her head had left Y-shaped marks all over the left side of her face and her left ear was split open. The Y-shaped marks were each like about two inches long. Okay. And I, as far as I read, they never did find what made that mark and what that weapon was. Yeah, that's a weird shape. It's definitely weird. There were minimal defense wounds. Um, so they assumed that she had been awakened suddenly and was violently killed yeah. very fast. There was a large bruised area on her left upper arm where she had been bitten. One of her fingers, um, like her pinky on her um, left side was uh, nearly severed from her hand. And there was some other bruising on her arm as well. She had been sexually violated by the rifle. It was found inserted five and a half inches into her body. Again, this was done post-mortem 
after death. There is no trace of fingerprints, and this time they didn't find uh, semen. They did find hair that looked to be from a black male, but it was not viable for DNA testing. So they're able to put a timeline together of where Carol was that night, but it doesn't produce any leads. She was in and out of her house that that night. She finally came home by about like 2.15 a.m., and they can confirm that by some people, neighbors that were in their yard, like out, teenagers out camping in their yard for whatever reason. It's the Pacific Northwest. People do weird stuff. The suspect used the sliding glass door to come and go, and no one saw a thing. Their dog didn't even bark. Oh, wow. Yeah. So for a while, they don't believe that the murders of Marianne Polreich and Carol Beath are connected. Nobody, like none of the investigators, nobody is connecting. Even though you've got two posed bodies who were violated sexually post-mortem. Yeah. They didn't believe that they were connected. Yeah, I, oh, I don't know. That's a hard connect. I I feel like it should have been Claire's day. Given what was going on at that time in that area. Yeah, but like one was at a dumpster and the other one was in someone's house and they didn't disturb the kids or anything like that. So, I mean, it's eh. just the location, I think, too. You know, one is in someone's room in the house where... Their children were home and the dogs didn't even bark. And in a neighborhood, the other one is by a restaurant, you know, by a dumpster too. Yeah. Where where it actually took place, no, you know, I, I, you haven't said yet, but. Well, they never find out. Oh, okay. They well, never find out. So, I mean, it's two totally different MOs or so they think. I, I guess, I guess to me why it's clear is looking back on it, maybe, the maybe beatings. that's. That, that's the, the only thing that I could yeah. see connecting those two is the the way that both women were brutally like beaten. That's the only thing I could think of. I yeah, I, and maybe maybe if you're looking at it from their point of view, then where they that's all the information they had. I still feel that it's unusual. Necrophilia is unusual. Yeah, it is definitely a very specific crime. That is outside of of rape, that is outside of murder. It is its own specific category that can happen with those two other things. But it also it also can can just happen on its own. It I don't know. It I mean it does involve a a body, a dead body. Yeah. But that doesn't always mean that you killed that body to engage in that. So I just find I that's what I find is should have been kind of, I I think, a red flag that they were almost exclusively operating under the assumption that these weren't connected. Yeah. When it should have at least been a 50 50 chance. So in this respect, it it spread the, you know, the investigators thin because they were working two different violent crimes. And at the time. There was, and I didn't, I guess this is something that's interesting that you wouldn't know unless you were around during that time. Bellevue didn't have a homicide unit. Oh. These types of crimes were so unheard of in Bellevue that the police department had what's called a crimes against persons unit. It wasn't specific to homicide. Okay. Right. Um, So they asked for help. A profiler in Seattle had stated that they were looking for a white male for Marianne's murder. And they clung to Carol's boyfriend as a suspect for a long, long time. He was eventually cleared. Okay. So meanwhile, George Russell is fascinated with the murders. According to friends he was staying with, he had clippings of the newspapers on the slings. He constantly talked to people about how the police were missing the connections and how dumb they were. He talked shit about the victims. He was calling them sluts and skanks. And people he was around began to notice that he was drinking very heavily during this time and acting different. No one had any idea of the reason why. Yeah. Yeah. Then the third victim was found on September 3rd after her landlords hadn't seen or heard from her for a few days. So she rented a basement apartment from a local fireman and his wife. They would often, like she would chat it up with them. They were on very good terms. She, you know, they kind of didn't budge and, you know, pry into her personal life, but they knew her comings and goings. And she didn't really hide that, you know, people would come over, guys would come over. She she didn't hide that from them. 
there had been a prowler in the backyard. The landlord had reported to police in the early morning of August 31st. It put them on high alert. And when the landlady noticed that one of the cats looked unfed the morning of uh, September 3rd, she entered the apartment to check on Andrea. And when she entered the bedroom, she immediately screamed for her husband. Um, 911 was called, but her husband knew that the rescue services were not needed. Yeah. He told them no sirens are needed. Take your time. Bring all the help that you can um, because of the way they found her body. Investigators would find the body of 24-year-old Andrea Levine posed nude on her bed. She had been beaten so badly, brain matter was leaking from her skull. Oh, Jesus. There was a plastic a dildo shoved in her mouth, and a copy of More Joy of Sex was under her left arm. Her legs were spread about three feet apart, um, so that that was the first thing that you saw when you entered the room. She had between 230 and 260 cut wounds all over her body. I'm talking even her scalp and the soles of her feet. Is that, did they know if that's postmortem or? Postmortem. Okay. It's something that's um, common in necrophiliac tendencies called picurism. It even appeared that there was a game of tic-tac-toe on her right breast. Okay, that's gross. Well, you know who did that? Ted Bundy. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, there are blood spatters across the bed and walls where the weapon was used to beat her had produced spray. And I had read that it was an aluminum bat, but I've also read that there was an account where they found a bloodied uh, wrench yeah. outside in a bush. So they couldn't confirm the weapon used in this case. Um, but I, I read those were two possibilities. There was no sign of forced entry and every knife that it could have possibly been in the house was taken. So butter knives, uh, scissors, anything that could have been suspected of being used as the weapon that cut her. He just was took taken. them all? He took them all. And the reasoning is, and he knew this well, if you can identify one knife out of a set of knives is missing, you have your weapon. Then from there, you can look at where they're sold where she might have gotten that yeah. and where she might have bought that. Then, you know, you're looking for one specific type of weapon yeah. and it opens up the evidence that they could have gotten from that. He took it all kind of smart, very smart, yeah. unfortunately. So there was no forced entry. Like I said, there was um, some possible traces of semen on the carpet by the bed. They took that. Um, they found no fingerprints. It was a very clean, except for the blood splatter. Mm -hmm. It was a clean crime scene. So Andrea had a very healthy social life. So it was easy to find a list of persons that they could like talk to and add as persons of interest. Yeah. They were also able to verify that she had been killed sometime before um, the afternoon of Friday the 31st by listening to the answering machine. So she had been in that apartment for somewhere around three days and her landlords had no idea. Wow. Um, in the days leading up to her death, she had told a few people that there had been a prowler around the apartment and that some of her money and personal things were missing, but she couldn't figure out how anybody was getting in. Wow. And then of course her landlords had seen that guy. Um, he knew it was a gentleman yeah. um, it, leaving, like running from their backyard the morning of the 31st, the dog actually let out the dog at like 5 a.m. And the dog's immediately fucking goes off. Yeah. And, um, you know, he's kind of like, okay, what you, what you barking at? It, it's not unheard of for cats or something. To, yeah. You know, she had cats she and the dog cats. wouldn't have barked yeah. at that. But it's not uncommon for other cats to come in the yard or, you know, other raccoons, anything like that to come around. And um, he noticed that on the far end of the yard, there was a guy running towards the fence to jump the fence. Oh. So he had called 911 on that day. They didn't realize that she was already dead. Oh, yeah. Wow. So the last confirmed sighting of her was um, dinner the night of the 30th with her boyfriend. She was home around 10 p.m. And that that was the last time she was heard from was leaving that restaurant and coming home. 
So her autopsy confirmed that she had been caught in a sudden violent attack, just as with Carol. Um, Cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head that fractured her skull severely. There were three long scratches found running down her back, maybe from fingernails. She also had that uh, those over 230 stab wounds. I read like 230 to 250 stab wounds estimated. She also, it was confirmed that she had been stabbed in the anal area, and that was post-mortem as well. Jesus. They believe that the murder weapon was an aluminum baseball bat, like I said, but there was also that, the wrench that had been found outside. The bat was completely wiped down and clean. Um, Her best friend had to come in and confirm that, you know, basically had to come in and get outfit for her to be buried in. And also confirmed that there was a amethyst ring that she always had on her that was missing. Um, If it wasn't on her body, then it would have been in a ring dish that she had. And it was nowhere nowhere to be found. I'm I'm seeing trophies. Right. Oh, yeah, definitely. Treasures, trinkets. That's definitely a a mark of a a sociopath. Because they, they want to remember. Serial killer wants to remember what they've done. And every time they go back to that, yeah. you know, they if they have that help to go back to that, then it helps them. It just helps them feel the pleasure, yeah. you know, relive the moment. Yes. So on August 6th, there's a meeting of like inter-district police forces that try and sort out like unsolved crimes in the area. They're trying to ask for any leads in the area um, that might help them out. And the Bellevue police, you know, come with their three, now three different crime scenes because they're still stating that Carol's was the boyfriend. Yeah. Marianne, they're not sure because it looks different. And now they have this other one that looks similar to all three of them, but who knows, could be somebody completely different. So they still haven't connected them? No. Okay. So one Seattle detective had a pretty good tip. He thought he was going to pass on to Bellevue um, on George Russell. Felt he was a good lead in connection to cat burglary that was happening in the area. So he, George, had been in trouble in Seattle for impersonating an officer with a stolen gun just weeks before. Oh. And he had actually been arrested. They couldn't make a charge stick. Mm -hmm. So he was just there for a little while. And then there was the domestic abuse charge from the girlfriend and her restraining order that was still in place. So it was just kind of instinct that told this detective that there was just something off with this guy. Uh-huh. When he was asked, he kind of, you know, he gave this information, but he also then asked the officers present, did any of them have reports of cat burglary or breaking and entering that they had unsolved in their areas, in their jurisdictions? And a lot of them were like, Yeah. Yeah, we do. Hmm. And he said, okay, how, have any of them described, you know, black man? And again, some of them were like, yeah, yeah, we, we've had reports. There was a couple that just reported in this area the other day that said a black man had entered and they found him just staring at him in, in his sleep. That's creepy. Very creepy. So this detective also knew some of the information from George's life on Mercer Island. And again, the MO fit. He was, you know, that was his MO over there. He was uh, breaking and entering. He was taking things from people. He was hiding them in, in places on the island. It was, it was disturbing, and it, you know, it progresses. There's a natural yeah. progression to these crimes. Yeah, that's one thing I've learned from the Golden State Killer is that he, it's definitely a progression in this. And then there's trophies and yeah. Right. So at that time, the consensus was still that Marianne and Andrea may have been killed by the same man. But Carol was differently, like definitely killed by a different person. Yeah. The detective said it didn't make sense that a man who knew her kids were home knew the layout of the house would use a flashlight looking around and would be comfortable doing what he did when the kids were there and he could easily be identified. And he's a hundred percent right. Yeah. That boyfriend could not have been involved. If you look at it from that perspective, there's no way it doesn't make sense. The kids knew him. So why would you do that? Just checking to see if they were still asleep. Yeah. But the chances of you, 
you know, you're the one with the key. That was her main boyfriend. Yeah. They were seeing other people, but he was the only one who had a key and would come and go. Oh. The kids knew that. Yeah. So in that respect, you are singling yourself out yeah. by doing that. It doesn't make sense if you're trying to get away with the crime. It just doesn't. Especially when your fingerprints would have already been all over that room. Yeah. Why would you be worried about it, the, you know, any weapons or the body having your fingerprints on it? Yeah. Well, you wouldn't. No. So wiping it down and having it clean doesn't make sense either. He really, he was, I think, a perspective that they needed of somebody on the outside looking in. Mm -hmm. And it, it definitely paid off. So the story fed to the press at that point was that there was no connection. There was no serial killer and that they were looking at several leads. They, they just didn't want to create this panic, mm -hmm. you know, given that time, the green river killer was still fresh, fresh and uncaught. And, you know, there was just, there was other stuff going on that created enough panic. They didn't want to add to it, yeah. you know, be that right or be that wrong. And it just, I don't know it at this point. I, I kind of am still saying, how did they not link these murders? It's just kind of really beyond me. Cause a lot of these guys in what I read had never seen a post body before. Yeah. Now all of a sudden you've seen three within the matter of months. Yeah. It is. It doesn't make sense. So working cases, you know, kind of like this in connection would have made sense. It pulled resources. Yeah. And there was some commonalities found there's, you know, they were all three of these women were in some way part of the bar scene. One of them worked as a bartender. The other mm. two frequently went out and then the manner of how they were violated sexually Yeah, it in the, you know, the necrophilia that's regardless if they're posed or not, those things are not common. No. So it, it really, I think they, they, got so stuck on finding suspects and yeah. finding, trying to find evidence that they couldn't, they just weren't pie piecing together the things that did make sense. Yeah. So the Seattle detective definitely got his message across to the Bellevue team and they began looking at George Russell. The lead detective in Marianne's investigation goes back to the officer who worked as a bouncer at Papagayo's. Yeah. And when they, you know, they kind of get to talking and the bouncer remembers that George left with a very unsteady woman and he took his friend's truck to give her a ride. Oh, right. Remember I mentioned the guy who was out in the parking lot and couldn't find his truck and he was super upset. Oh, okay. Right. Well, that was George's friend Smitty. They had arrived together. Uh-huh. And George said, um, you know, oh, hey, I need to change my shirt before because at, at a certain hour, you know, anybody could get in. It wasn't necessarily a club. Yeah. But then at a certain time, they uh, require you to be dressed a certain way for, yeah. you know, club attire. Uh -huh. So I was like, hey, let me have your truck keys so I can go on into my duffel bag and change my shirt into a collared shirt. I'll be right back. He doesn't come back. Oh, <laughs> he, he bounces. He actually ends up taking the truck back to Smitty's home on Mercer Island the next morning, early in the morning. And it smells so bad, Smell. so bad. And when, you know, this was, this was Smitty's baby. Yeah. He was constantly detailing this truck. He kept this truck immaculate mm -hmm. and that's why he was so upset when it wasn't in the parking lot because this was like his pride and joy. Oh, his baby. Right. And so when Smitty bring, or when George brings it back, um, he's like, what the fuck happened here? Like what, what in the hell, what is this smell? Like he, he couldn't even stand to be in the cab of the truck because yeah. it smelled so bad. He ended up detailing the hell out of it and cleaning it like four different times. And there were spots that he could never get out. Yeah. And then he had like taken the floor mats uh -huh. out and replaced them. And it just like the smell just permeated. Really? And at the time George had like dropped off the truck in the morning. The guy was still asleep. His sister was getting ready for a yard sale with somebody else at his house. So 
she's like, Hey, you know, what, what did you do to my brother's truck? Like he's going to be pissed. And uh, George was like, Oh yeah. You know, I gave somebody a ride home and she ended up throwing up her clam chowder and getting really sick. And I've tried to clean it, but you know, I'll come over and clean it later. And he leaves the truck and then Smitty wakes up and, you know, calls him and he's like, what the fuck? (laughs) Why does my truck smell so bad? It's like, I can't even sit in it. It's making me gag. And George says, I got sick. I threw up in your truck. So, I I mean, even there, he's given two different stories. And the guys are like, wow, okay, whatever. And George is like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll pay to have it detailed and, and Smitty was like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm going to take care of it. Like this is his baby and he has all the stuff and he's going to detail it himself. And he does. It just never quite is right in that truck afterwards. Yeah. So they don't know about Smitty though. They don't talk to him for a while. The bouncer writes a report up, but he can't remember Smitty's like actual name. Yeah. And it's valuable information which, you know, helps them in the long run, but not at the time. So police are working the case. It's painfully slow. But one night, a call comes into Seattle police dispatch from a very distraught female who says there's um, somebody who was knocking on her window. And it was like long tapping. Definitely distinctive as somebody trying to like tap on the window and get your attention. Yeah, And she's uncomfortable. She is uh, familiar with George and she's friends with the girlfriend who has the restraining order on him. And she definitely knows his habits yeah. of just showing up places and um, she's rightfully scared. So police show up. They find that her uh, screen on her sliding glass door has been pried off. And, you know, she's there alone at that time when the police come. Her roommate shows up and she was like, hey. Did you know that George Russell is outside downstairs? And in her mind, that's that's all the proof she needs. Yeah. That was that was George. He was fucking with me. And the police are like, oh, well, you know, who's this George Russell? It's just, you know, patrolman. Uh-huh. And they go down and they're talking to him. But as they talk to him and they're, you know, he's given him a, an alibi for the night. Yeah. Uh, they run him in the system. And it comes out that he has an alibi, but he also has some outstanding warrants. Oh, so they bring him in and he's interviewed because the, I mean, this is like a gift from the gods for these Bellevue people. Yeah. And they go talk to him in the early morning and he puts on this cool, calm act. He's not affected. He's talking to them like it's no big deal, Uh but his body language is completely rigid. Oh. Very posed, very controlled. Yeah. What he's saying, though, is, you know, oh, you you guys got it all wrong. Like, no, 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 no. I, I didn't know any of those. I wasn't trying to break into so-and-so's house. And yeah, that, that wasn't me. I was just hanging out. I have that alibi. And yeah, you know, Andrea, yeah, I knew her from some mutual friends. I had helped her out. And um, she had ran out of gas one time. And I went and helped her out and got her some gas and took her home. Yeah. And, you know, I'd I'd been over to her house and she tried to invite me in, but I said, no, thank you. And, you know, I don't know. I didn't really know Marianne. I've seen her a few times, but I didn't really know her. She's not really my type. He's just on and on and on. And it it sounds good. You know, it sounds exactly what somebody wants you to hear is what it sounds like. The only problem is that they see through it, but they have nothing that it's like hard evidence they can connect him with. There's just, there's nothing really that they can give to him and say, but we know about X, Y, Z because he's, he is not admitting to anything. And he's even saying, if you guys let me go, I can probably help you figure this out. I, you know, I've helped the police on Mercer Island many times as an informant in helping them out with their cases. I probably can help you out. I know a lot of people. And he's trying to bargain with them all the while trying to get information from them just as he did previously. Mm -hmm. So they, you know, they're like, Hey, if you want to help, you know, why don't you uh, help us with a saliva and a, you know, a hair sample. Uh And that's where he flashes. And he's like, absolutely not. No. Shouldn't there be somebody in here with me while I'm talking to you? Uh Oh, any lawyer, he wants to lawyer up. 
so the conversations end. They still have him on the warrant, so he's not going anywhere. Yeah. They have him for a little while, and they know that, but they know that time is ticking. And right now they have nothing substantial yeah. to keep him there indefinitely. So it takes a month, but they finally get Smitty to let them investigate their truck. Mm-hmm. He won't let the baby go. Yeah. And they weren't able to search it until October. He he was like in custody for three weeks at that point. Oh. And Smitty was very reluctant to hand over his truck. Mm-hmm. I don't think at that point it had clicked for him probably yeah. that his truck was a potential crime scene. Yeah. So uh, he's just worried about his, his baby Yeah. and they start to de- deconstruct it. There's a large spot on the a seat cushion that reveals that it's blood uh-huh. and it's a tight match for Marianne, but DNA takes time to come back. So It's like 40% of the population could have matched to that too. So that doesn't say anything. Meanwhile, they're trying to connect the murders and see, they seek out advice from a psychiatrist um, in Seattle who absolutely confirms without a doubt, there is one killer between these three victims. Um, The crimes show a progression and the posing is specific to how the killer knew them in their life. So without a doubt, it's one man. Yeah. And it's apparent that the killer had little regard for females, which given his family history of, you know, the interest that the lack of interest from the female members of his family, you know, his grandmother, he was raised with his grandmother and his aunts. They couldn't be really bothered with him. Mm -hmm. His mom had abandoned him twice and wasn't present in his life. There were all these these things that had they known that about him. There again, we have this knowledge now. It might have helped them then, but they didn't have it. Eventually, DNA comes back on the blood, and there's only a 6% of the Caucasian population, including Marianne, that would match the DNA of like the blood Uh that they found in her on her crime scene. When they get samples to test from George, he is within 6% of the African American population that would have matched the sperm sample found on her body. Oh. So they can link her to the truck from that blood and they can link him to her with the semen. Okay. So they have their case. They bring first degree murder charges against George Russell and the murder of Mary Ann Polreich one day before he was due to be released from jail with those warrants from serving the time from the warrants. They got Mm. it just in the nick of fucking time. Good. Yeah. So he doesn't leave. Um, George, of course, pleads innocent. He, He doesn't know anything about nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Investigators now have time to build the case uh, against him for Carol Beath and Andrea Levine. They had kind of lucked out with some information with Carol Beath and found out that she was connected to the waitress who got George kicked out of the Black Angus. Oh. So, and it's, it's a stretch, but it makes sense. The waitress, her last name was Coffin. Marianne had been posed outside of where she worked as if she was a corpse in a coffin. Okay. Carol was also a good likeness for the waitress, and it's presumed that she was the stand-in for his anger when he couldn't get to the waitress because she moved to Hawaii after they found Marianne. She was done. She was, you know, stressed over him threatening her. Yeah. She knew that he was still around and involved in the scene, Yeah. and he knew where where to find her and her kids. And she had met a a guy who was a contractor who was like, let's just start over in Hawaii. And she said, yep, peace out. And she fucking left. And it probably saved her life. Could be worse places to go to. I honestly. So the DA agrees that this is a plausible scenario that, you know, Marianne, her body was posed there as a message to this waitress and posed the way that she was. Makes sense when you know her last name is Coffin. Yeah. So they move forward to prosecute. One of their many calls to everyone that was in George's realm, uh, which was probably like half of fucking Seattle, gave them a lead on the amethyst ring that was discovered missing from Andrea's home. So George had given it to one of his friends, but she felt odd about having it after he was arrested for Marianne's murder. Oh, Uh, Well, charged for Marianne's murder. Um, It ended up in a Florida pawn shop way the fuck across the country. 
so she didn't feel comfortable having it. She gave it to a friend of hers. This friend ended up with his girlfriend hitchhiking across the country to go swim with the dolphins in Florida. Sweet. It's the most incredible series of events. Yeah. Uh, really, honestly. So they track down this guy when he finally reaches to Florida. They're, um, you know, asking him about the ring. He was like, yeah, I had it. I had to pawn it because we got here. We had no money. And the pawn shop is, you know, here. here's the description of it. Here's where it was. Um, I was there just a few days ago. They should still have it. And they even had to cut it off my finger because I my my swol- my fingers were swollen from the humidity. So they had to cut it off of my finger oh. to like to pawn it. Yeah. He got five bucks for it. Sweet. <laughs> right. So they track down this pawn shop and they contact, you know, the guy and the guy is actually very cooperative. And he, he was like, yeah, you know, hold on. I'll, I'll see if I still have it. Cause he had actually was going to melt it down yeah. and sell the stone. Yeah. Cause I mean, once you cut it off, there's no really, unless you're a jeweler, mm-hmm. you can't connect that. Back. Right. So he was lucky that it hadn't been done yet. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the, the investigator. So it was strong evidence that they, they could tie some things together. There was, there were still other stories that were plausible. Like it could have been stolen by anybody and they flew to Florida and pawned a bunch of stuff yeah. or, you know, there, there's always a, what if it couldn't be connected necessarily to George specifically, but it could be connected through a line Yes. Of, you know, zigzagging back and forth that it's possible he he had it at one point. Yeah. So they, um, because of that, decide to bring murder charges for Carol and Andrea to the ones for Marianne. And they decided their best course of action was to try the three together because each one separately was shaky mm-hmm. at best. And the three of them together actually showed the progression. And if you, you know, if you're looking at the crime scenes, like to me, if you're looking at the scenes, it shows that they're related. It shows that they're linked, even though the police didn't see it at first. I think that it would be easier to give that information to a jury. And I think they were right to try to do that because the jury then could see, yeah, it's a a female who lived on her own. It's, you know, somebody who was part of the bar scene. Mm -hmm. It's somebody that, you know, he had a connection to even if in a roundabout way that yeah. nobody else knew. We all knew with George that he had connections all over the place. Mm-hmm. So I, I just feel like that they were right to do that, but it, it was, a, it was a risk at that time to do that because they, they didn't know whether the jury was going to buy it or not, honestly. Yeah. So the trial begins um, September 13th. Keep in mind, this is the first serial killer trial in Washington state. Okay. I, when you're thinking about that, yeah, because Bundy wasn't tried here for his crimes. No. The Green River killer was, as, you know, wasn't caught yet. And other high profile um, profile killers were not committing crimes yet or weren't serial killers. Yeah. So this one was kind of a big fucking deal. It began, like I said, September 13th. The FBI actually sent out the infamous John Douglas to stand as a witness. Oh. He was there to give perspective on the inner workings of a serial killer's mind, but also on the um, linking of the posing mm-hmm. and how uncommon that was in connection with posing and necrophilia. Yeah. The defense also had an FBI witness who argued that the posing of the bodies was not the workings of the same criminal. They weren't killed in the same way. They weren't brutally like violated in the same way. It was different with each case. Mm-hmm. Two were at home. One was at the dumpster. You know, it, they don't link. And the jury didn't want to hear it because yeah. they shortly convicted him. That was October 25th, 1991. They convicted him of first degree murder of Mary Ann Polreich and aggravated first degree murder of Carol Beef and Andrea Levine. He was sentenced to life in prison without parole and an additional 29 years in prison. He was 33 years at the, old at the time. Just in case. Yeah. Just in case we're going to tack on 29 more years. Yeah. Just, just for good measure. I mean, he's not getting out on parole, so he's not going anywhere regardless. Yeah. Um, he still maintains his innocence of all the crimes. Sweet. And he has appealed his conviction 
which has led nowhere. He tried to appeal on the DNA. He tried to appeal on the FBI witnesses, which didn't make any sense because he had one in his own defense. So Mm. when they were looking at the FBI witnesses, they had to actually look at both, whether to keep both of them or dismiss both of them um, from being used as, you know, witnesses Mm -hmm. in the case. The judge was like, no, that's no, you had, you had well knowledge individuals on both sides arguing. Yeah. Your lawyers had their chance to make a, a point with their witness. They didn't get it across. You mm-hmm. don't get to come back and appeal that. Yeah. Yeah, there was there was all sorts of appeals that he he felt he was entitled to a new trial with to overturn his conviction. None of them have amounted to anything. Mm. So he currently sits in Washington State Pen in Walla Walla, Washington. Sweet. He's in good company. He is in good company. We we have a lot of friends there now. Yeah. Yeah. I What kind of keeps me astounded in this one is that he was able to pull off hundreds, if not thousands of break-ins over the course of like 20 years. Wow. I mean, that definitely shows progression too. Because yeah. I mean, Golden State Killer wasn't, you know, he did it for a long time. The ransacker. Right. Breaking, entering. I I mean honestly he and he went back like to the families on Mercer Island he went back three or four times oh really to the same place like Mercer Island is not very big no and it's very um it, it's definitely an affluent area for people to live yeah um it, you know there's there's kind of that party lifestyle for for kids out there there's not much for them to do so they get into a lot of trouble mm-hmm. but his trouble was like uh, its own special brand of crazy yeah. He would have like little hideouts on the island in the woods where he would, you know, kids would go out and party with smoking, alcohol, whatever. He was getting drugs from his stepdad's dentist office, like narcotics and stuff, and selling it to kids that were younger than him. He always hung out with somebody who was younger than him. It was, he never had friends his age. He, you know, basically because he was able to keep conning them. Yeah. You know, it never... He never learned a lesson from any of the times that he was caught. And then when he, you know, got kicked out of his stepdad's house and he started ending up over in Bellevue, Seattle, that area, it was just natural for him to wander at night yeah. and see where, where he could get into and what he could do and how he could get away with, with stealing things. And he did repeatedly. And even in the neighborhoods where the murders happened, they had been reporting strings of cat burglary for weeks before these murders happened. Yeah, it it leads me to wonder too. You said he had a really high IQ, but he hung out with younger kids. I don't know if that's just a maturity thing. Like he may be a genius, but he's also immature. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I it's I think they should be two different tests. Like there should be a different test for right. maturity too. It's yeah, just because you're smart doesn't mean that you are mature or or even that you have a a morality like maturity of morality of right and wrong that doesn't mean anything no you can have a high iq IQ and and still act like a juvenile delinquent even at the age of 30 yeah you know he yeah he was breaking in all over the fucking place or it just could be his manipulation like his you know gift of gab was so good that only only, oh, see, yeah. the, only the younger guys would fall for that. Younger kids, not the older kids, his age. No, and he, I mean, he had a lot of people going. He had where he was staying at at the time when he was arrested for the warrants, which led to all of, you know, the actual solving of the crime. Yeah. He was staying with four teenage girls in an apartment that one of their dads was was letting them use. They had just graduated from high school. He was staying with them all summer. Oh, and they felt safe with him there because there was burglars. There was people, you know, he would he would be like their protector, their big brother. If people would come over and start acting a fool, he'd be like, no, get the fuck out. Yeah. It was it, it was definitely a contradiction to what he then in turn went and did to these women. Yeah, he's definitely a sociopath because if, you, you know, oh, the burglars is probably him doing it. Yeah. And then he's like, "Oh, I'll save you." Yeah, Don't worry no, about he it. definitely was. And there were multiple times when fucking crazy. It is fucking crazy. There were multiple times when he was, uh, you know, at their apartment and talking about these murders. Yeah, 
about how the cops would never catch him about how, you know, they, they definitely were all connected. And if they asked him, then he could have been able to help him help the investigators. And, you know, he was still maintaining to this day, all these, like these teenage girls thought that he was like an undercover narc hmm. and he was assisting the police. Cause he went everywhere with his scanner. He was no place without that scanner. Wow. So if somebody called the cops. He knew it and he ran when he was breaking and entering. Yeah. He was one step ahead. Yeah. And he, I mean, even on Mercer Island, he would come out with his scanner and he would know that the cops were there and he'd be like, oh yeah, that's who they, you, it's me that they called the cops on. Huh. I was just out here doing whatever. And he'd always have a story. He'd always have a fucking story. I should mention too that there was also a reporting, he was suspected but never charged in a beating of a young girl outside of her apartment. After the third murder took place, um, it fit the M.O. She was locked out of her apartment and she had been trying to get in and was trying to wake up her brother. But her brother wasn't waking up. So then she had gone around the back of the apartment to her parents um, room and was yeah. trying to get them up and then pops up this guy out of the bush. Oh, shit. And he's like, oh, hey, aren't you friends of so and so? Isn't that your brother or something? And she was like, yeah, I'm locked out of the apartment. I'm trying to get in and. Uh, you know, he tries to be helpful. And the next thing uh, she knows, she's being bludgeoned with a rock. Holy shit. And if her dad and a neighbor hadn't come out of their apartments um, and scared him away, she probably would have ended up like the other victims. But he was a friend of her brother's. Her brother did know him. Yeah. And then she also had a mutual friend that he had actually, George had tried to sell this mutual friend, Carol Beath's ring, Oh. her wedding ring. That it was missing. Okay. And that was later something that they they couldn't prove because the they don't know where the ring went. Yeah. But the guy was able to draw out a picture of the ring without seeing a photo of it. Oh. Without he was just asked, you know, do you know this guy? And he was like, Yeah, George tried to sell me this fucking ring. And they're like, Whoa, what ring? Because they already had the amethyst at that point. Yeah. And it was like out of left field, they didn't even ask him about it. And he was like, yeah, he, you know, he was, he was always trying to sell people things. He was always giving away jewelry or selling jewelry, or he always had shit that he was trying to get rid of or, yeah. or you know, was given away. And yeah. He needed money one time and he asked me if I wanted to buy this ring. He draws a picture of it and the investigator's like, what the fuck? That's Carol's ring. Yeah. Like we, we've been trying to figure out where that went and nobody knows where it went. He, he managed to, you know, get rid of it. George did. But the guy clear as day was like, yeah, that's that's what I saw. That's what he tried to get me to buy from him. Huh. So there was a connection to this girl through that guy. And so, I, I mean, good chances are that it is him. Uh -huh. um, she certainly seemed to think that it was him. They never brought charges against him because there was no proof. Yeah. Other than her being able to hide. But she ended up unconscious waking up in the uh, intensive care unit. Oh, from head injuries, yeah. pretty serious That'll do head it. injuries. So they didn't really think that she could validate who it was that was responsible. Yeah. But it definitely fits the MO. So, yeah, he, I don't know what he was doing out there. He's probably prowling. Yeah. Trying to get into people's apartments per usual. So um, definitely a case of, I think we've all kind of known that person too. I was, you know, thinking back to my high school years in Eureka of people who always seemed to, we called them floaters because they never seemed to be tied down to a home or a residence. Mm -hmm. And they were always, you know, they always had a story. Yeah. You'd always be entertained for a little bit, mm -hmm. but in the end, either they were creepy or they were drug addicts or, yeah. so, you know, something was really bad with them. Nobody wanted to be around them. Yeah. And I, I think we all kind of know people like that. Yeah. Until you, until you get to an age where you're wise enough to disassociate yourself. And that's why it was easy. Like you said, the teenagers, it was easy to, yeah. to con and step in and be the big brother and protector. The protector. And, yeah. yeah. So that's, that's all we got. That was a lot. Yeah. It's a lot of, um, very interesting details of, of what he did to those bodies. And, it just makes you wonder what the fuck is going on in some people's heads. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got just three more episodes to the end of the season. And it's crazy to think we're already almost at the end of our second season. Yeah. Yeah. 
I haven't really had any time off, though. We'll take a little time off. Oh, are you is, sure? Is that okay? It's okay with me. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, as always, we love to hear from you guys. Leave us reviews and five stars wherever you can. Of course, interact with us on social media. And until then, stay safe, be kind, and stay out of the goddamn woods. Stay out of the woods. Bye, guys. Bye.